Well, good morning. Uh, thank you for coming to this session, and thank you for joining us at reInvent. Uh, so for those of you who uh, just saw Werner talk, uh, one of the things he said was that uh, if you hug a server, the server is unlikely to hug you back. Uh, in my experience as a network guy, uh, if you try to hug a router, uh, routers don't hug you back either. <laughs> so uh, this talk is going to actually uh, share with you how Amazon uh, virtual networks uh, allow you to build uh, a programmable network uh, and do so in a, in a simple and robust way uh, and allow you to control those networks. And so uh, I'd like to first off see a quick show of hands. How many of you have ever been asked this question, why can't I connect to the server? <laughs> Probably most of you. I hear it pretty often. Uh, so today what we're going to do is actually look at a number of scenarios for, uh, four scenarios actually, for how uh, uh, for different traffic flows that occur within Amazon's virtual networks and a oh, deep dive on how each of those traffic flows works uh, and, and, and the steps involved, the hops that are involved in those flows. And so this is going to be a pretty technical talk, uh, so uh, uh, bear with me as we go into the kind of the, the technical details of how this happens on a hop-by-hop -hop basis. Uh, just to give you a brief background on myself, I, I've, uh, I'm Kevin Miller. I've worked with, uh, I've led virtual private cloud engineering teams for about the last four years. So the first thing we're going to talk about, the first uh, scenario is instance-to-instance uh, -instance communication uh, within a single subnet. So this would likely be, for example, if you have uh, two devices in the same availability zone, uh, two instances, that is, in the same availability zone, uh, talking back and forth. And then we're going to take it up one level uh, and talk about instances that are crossing subnets. So for example, an instance uh, that would be in one availability zone talking to an instance in another availability zone, uh, because that would... That would be uh, between two subnets by definition. And then the third scenario we're going to look at is what happens when you go from an instance out to the internet. And finally, we'll talk about what happens when, you, uh, when an instance is communicating uh, with uh, a host uh, at your own data center or your, your corporate network uh, using our VPN or our Direct Connect service. All right, so when I, uh, uh, the first thing that I like to do when I uh, look at, a, I hear about this question, you know, my, I can't connect to the server, is I, I start by, uh, in many cases, actually getting out a piece of paper and, and drawing out the, the two machines that are, uh, the two instances that are having uh, difficulty communicating, and then making sure that I'm uh, identifying which is the direction that we're actually seeing the communication difficulty. Uh, and I like to actually even be very explicit and write down, you know, what are the IP addresses involved, and what's the IP protocol that's involved, and what are the source and destination ports. So we're very explicit about uh, what, the, what problem we're trying to troubleshoot. Because in many cases, uh, you, uh, it may seem that you're having a problem communicating from instance A to instance B, but in reality, it actually may be the opposite path. It may be that the packets are getting to the instance B, but they're not making, the responses aren't coming back. So it's important that we, we identify that up front. And one of the first tools that I often use when I'm trying to answer that very question is, is just a simple TCP dump. Uh, or you can use Wireshark, for example, on Windows as well. And using these tools, um, here's an example where I just uh, ran a TCP dump on an instance uh, and saw the, the traffic that was flowing. And then from that output, you can extract, as, I, as I've shown at the bottom uh, with the colors, uh, you can extract the, the instances that are involved, the IP addresses of the two instances, uh, as well as the source ports and destination ports. And of course, in this version, uh, in this uh, TCP dump output, uh, it's actually translating port 22 into its more common name of SSH. Uh, but there's a flag to TCP dump as well if you want to have that turned off. So again, this is kind of the first step uh, to uh, identify which path uh, the, the problem is occurring. And then we can start really digging in. So uh, today you're going to see this, uh, uh, this diagram a couple times, and this is uh, just a kind of a sample uh, network that I put together to try to illustrate uh, some of these packet flows that, I've, that I'm going to be talking about through today. And so uh, you can see I, in this uh, simple network I have three subnets, and these could be subnets in the same availability zone or across availability zones. Uh, as you may know, subnets, uh, are, a single subnet exists in a single availability zone. So you could think of this even as a... Um, uh, well, in this case, subnet 1 and subnet 2 ha would have to be in the same availability zone because instance B actually has two interfaces uh, in those two subnets. But in this case, I have the three subnets. Uh, I have two instances that are connected into my subnet 1. Uh, another uh, single instance, instance C, is on my subnet 3. 
And then instance B uh, uses, uh, takes advantage of our new feature, one of our, our newest features, uh, which is that it can have multiple elastic network interfaces. And so in this case, it has an elastic network interface into both subnet one and two. Uh, and sorry, before I go on, I'll just, uh, so today, uh, right now, I'm gonna be talking then about communication from instance A to instance B, uh, just on this uh, subnet one. So I'll just uh, illustrate over there, instance A to instance B. And so uh, this is a, a, a diagram of the hops that a packet is going to be um, processed through uh, in order to make its way from instance A over to instance B. And what I'm gonna do is actually just uh, walk through each of these hops and share how you can investigate uh, and uh, understand how to uh, correctly configure each, one, each of these steps. And so the first step is the routing table on the local instance. And this is a step that is sometimes overlooked but the routing table on the instance uh, does matter. Uh, packets, um, as they're leaving uh, instance A, directed to instance B, the routing table uh, will, uh, will come into play. The, the first step is for the kernel to check its routing table and identify what the, the destination, uh, the next hop will be. And so as an example, uh, this is an example out for output from uh, Linux or Windows, uh, Linux and Windows, uh, that show you the routing table. And in this case, because I'm going uh, between two instances in the same subnet, it's actually going to follow the, um, the, the 10 slash 24 route, which indicates to the kernel that this is a, a directly connected subnet. Uh, and that's actually the indication to the kernel that it needs to do the next step, which we'll talk about, which is to do then an ARP resolution uh, to find the MAC address for that, uh, for that other instance. If it was crossing subnets, it would actually have hit the default route, uh, in which case the kernel would then forward that directly to its default gateway, which would be the 10001. So again, this is the first step. As I, as I mentioned, the second step will then be a look up into the ARP table. And uh, the ARP table is very easy to query, but again, both on Linux and Windows, you can identify uh, what the uh, uh, ARP table currently shows, what the kernel has. And, and, and of course, uh, uh, the kernels typically will resolve uh, an IP address uh, into its MAC address and then cache that data for some period of time. So you can inspect what the current cache is to see that it's in fact resolved. Uh, in this case, as I'm showing uh, here, that it's actually resolved the, um, the MAC address for that, uh, for that IP address. Uh, if you did not see it uh, properly resolved, then, then that would be an indication either that that instance isn't running or that instance may have, may have failed for some reason and, and it's not able to, to respond. So following the ARP table, the next step will be a, uh, it'll be processed through the outbound firewall. Uh, most uh, uh, virtual machines these days uh, do have outbound firewalls, uh, although you know, in some cases they're, they're not configured, uh, but it, you know, for, for completeness, uh, it's, it's important that you consider what the, the firewall looks like. And on Linux, uh, it's actually, you know, again, very easy to inspect using command line tools. You can inspect what the firewall uh, currently uh, shows. And you can also, uh, in, in, in this uh, output here, uh, you can inspect how many packets and bytes have hit each one of your rules in your outbound firewall. So this is a good way to kind of sanity check if you're, if you're having a problem where you're not a step, you know, you're having loss between instances, you can inspect your firewall rules and make sure that the, the rules that you think are, are being hit uh, are in fact the ones that are, are being hit. You can watch the counters and, and, and make sure that that's, uh, you know, the, the counters that you expect to be growing are, are in fact growing. Okay, so moving on then. Now we have, um, at this point, we've passed all of the kind of steps uh, within the instance and the packet is forwarded into uh, the virtual private cloud, into, into the, uh, the AWS service. And the first stop there is what we call the source desk check. Uh, and this is an important uh, a check that's done. It's actually a, a security mechanism that we have uh, in, our, in our platform. And what this does is uh, for packets that are coming into the network, it will verify that the source IP address of the packet is uh, one of the IP addresses that, that we know belongs to that, that instance. And so this is one of the mechanisms we have which will prevent an instance from spoofing its IP address coming into the network. Uh, and this uh, source desk check is actually uh, easy to uh, identify, easy to uh, compare or to, to, to check on the AWS management console as I've, as I've shown here. Um, and we, actually, we also actually provide a way for you to turn off the source desk check uh, if you uh, uh, have a use case that requires it. So for example, um, if you're running an instance that's doing NAT or, or VPN, 
Um, this would be something that you would need to disable uh, to, so that you could send packets out this interface uh, that uh, have different source IPs from one of the IPs that's actually assigned to that instance. And so again, you know, showing here, this is how you can actually just go through our management console or use our command line tools as shown uh, to turn that check off. And that can be done on an individual instance basis. All right, so then after we pass the source test check, the next check then is through our outbound security groups. And again, this is a, a powerful feature of Amazon's virtual networks uh, that allows you to specify firewall rules that we enforce in the infrastructure on the instances that are running. And security groups have great um, capabilities in, in that you can uh, create rules that refer to other members of the security group. So rather than needing to track uh, individual IP addresses for all of your instances, you can have them belong to a security group and then create rules that refer to members of that security group. So the, the first stop here will then be the security group outbound rules. And this is something that if you've used EC2 for a while, you know that um, historically uh, EC2 has not had the ability to have uh, security group rules on the outbound direction. Uh, this is now a feature of Amazon Virtual Private Cloud. If you're running in VPC, you can create these outbound security group rules. And so here's an example, through, again, through our management console where you can, you can see what the, the rules are that have been configured for uh, this particular security group. And um, this is, as you can see, this is a, a security group named management. And so this would apply to any instances that are, um, uh, that are launched into that management security group. And you can actually change what groups the, an instance belongs to dynamically, uh, again, using our management console, even after the instance is running. And on the outbound direction, uh, the rules, you can see on the, the right-hand side here, the rules show um, the ports and, and the destination uh, ranges. These would apply to the, so, so here, the, the outbound security group will be looking at your destination port. Uh, it'll look at the packet's destination port and the destination IP address, and then it'll match it into the security group rules. Um, security group rules are all allows. Uh, there's no ability in security groups to define denies. And I'll actually have a slide later where I kind of compare and contrast uh, where we, we can do some denies if, you're, if, you, if you need that kind of capability. Okay, so now the packet has passed all of the outbound checks and the packet will then be forwarded through virtual private cloud in, um, to, to, towards your uh, other instance. And as it's approaching that other instance, before we, before we deliver the packet out of the network into your instance, uh, then we start to apply the, the kind of the inbound rules. And so the first one that we apply is an inbound security group check. This is very similar to the outbound security group rules. Uh, the, the only um, kind of difference is that the, uh, in this case, on the inbound side, we're comparing the source IP address and the destination port. Uh, and those are the two pieces of the packet that are then compared to the security group rules to determine if the uh, traffic is allowed to pass. Okay, again, on the inbound side, then we have a, another source desk check. In this case, we are checking that the destination IP address matches one of the IP addresses configured on the, that interface. So again, on the outbound side, we check for the, the source IP. We make sure the source IP matches. On the inbound side, we make sure the destination IP matches. And so this is, you know, again, another uh, uh, check, a security check, that ensures that instances are only seeing the traffic um, that, they, that is um, addressed to them. Okay, and then finally, uh, the packet will be uh, then delivered up to your instance, uh, delivered through your virtual, the virtual network adapters into your instance, and they'll go through uh, the inbound firewall rules if you have any configured. Uh, and you know, again, using the same kind of tools that we used earlier, we can, we can just look to see what the, uh, uh, what the rules are and, and whether, what, how many packets are hitting them, how many bytes are being hit by them. Okay, so uh, we have now uh, uh, seen kind of the, the, the steps involved from getting a packet from instance A over to instance B. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind that uh, the, you know, so I've shown you the path from A to B, but as I mentioned up front, if, if the actual problem is with B to A, then all of this would just be flipped. All of these rules would just be applied in the re reverse direction. And so for any given flow, um, to be to, to forward, uh, really both directions need to be uh, configured uh, and working. Okay, so 
now I'm going to talk about uh, a slightly more uh, complicated scenario. And what I'm going to show, uh, and I'll, I'll quickly jump back, but I'm gonna sh we're going to talk between instance B and instance C. And so um, as you can see, instance B actually has two interfaces that the traffic can come and go. And then of course, instance C is kind of sitting on its own on the far side on subnet three. It's kind of lonely. We'll get some packets to it here in a moment. Uh, so on instance B, uh, I, I, I'm showing an, an additional step that we kind of glossed over in the first example. Uh, and that's the IP routing policy database. And this is, um, this is actually a Linux feature. Uh, the, and the IP routing policy database, as I'm going to show, is actually pretty important because uh, instance B has, the, has two IP addresses. And uh, the, all of the, the, the security group rules and the other rules that apply to this traffic are going to be based on which interface the traffic is actually sent out of instance B whether it's sent over its uh, interface in subnet one or the interface in subnet two. And so as an example of the kind of problem that can crop up uh, when you have inter instances with ha that have multiple interfaces, um, this is a, an example where I have uh, an instance, my instance B has its two interfaces that, I, that we've been talking about. An instance, there's another instance um, in, the, in the 10 0 one network that's, that's trying to talk to instance B. So if that instance connects to the 10.0.0.211 IP address, um, the traffic will make it over to instance B. But depending on what is configured in our main routing table, uh, that, uh, and, and likely in a, in a default configuration, out of the box configuration, uh, the response back to that instance, to the 10.0.150 instance, would be routed out the ETH1 interface. And so what, what we would actually see on the wire on the network is a packet that has the source IP that, uh, of 211, because that's what this other instance connected to. And the destination would be the 10.0.150 address. And if that is forwarded out ETH1, by default, that's, that traffic will be dropped, because the source desk check will fail. And it's likely that you may have security groups or other rules that are going to block that traffic as well. And so this is where the IP routing database, uh, or I see, I'm sorry, the IP uh, routing rules uh, actually start to uh, matter a lot. And I'm going to show you how that, how that works. So again, you know, here's the configuration. You can use some simple command line to identify the configuration. We have our ETH0 and our ETH1 on the, the two different networks. And in a default out-of-box configuration, uh, we'll have an IP, our, our main routing table will have a default route through one of them, uh, usually the ETH0, and then the, uh, the, the routes to the subnet one and subnet two uh, will be configured as, as local routes. So if, when, when traffic is being sent back to the 1001 address, uh, it's gonna, it, it will, it will, the, the routing table will do a longest prefix match, and it will match this, uh, this third rule, and then it'll be sent out ETH1. And at the bottom here, I've shown just a kind of a simple way uh, that you can actually test this uh, even without having uh, something else connect in. You can, uh, in this case, you can kind of force SSH to try to use an, a different IP address, use one IP address to initiate the connection. And in this case, it's trying to initiate a connection using the subnet one IP address uh, to, a, to something on, on subnet two. And if we do a TCP down bullet, we'll see that it's, it's sending it out the ETH1 interface and it's not getting a response. So how do we fix this? Uh, well, the IP rule database comes in really handy here because what you can configure is actually, uh, you can configure secondary routing tables. Linux has this support for multiple routing tables. And the way that, um, so here's an example just of how you can configure it. And what you do is you, you basically, uh, first off, create an alias for the routing table just so we can refer to it by a friendly name. So in this case, I'm referring to it as my ETH1 routing table, ETH1RT. And then I add a rule to the IP rules database to say any traffic that is being sent with a source IP of 10.0.1.99, I want you to, instead of using the main routing table to route that traffic, I want you to route that using my ETH1 routing table. And you can then inspect that rule list and you can see the rule 32.765 is the one that I just added. And the normal rule and, and everyone who's running a Linux instance actually is running, uh, you know, has this database today, and, and so the, your packets are actually going through this. Uh, most cases, you're going to be using this 32766 rule, which sends it to the, your main routing table. So once I've created my IP rule, 
I can then create, a, a, I can then update the routes or add the routes into my ETH1 routing table. And all I really need to do is add a default route which says send any traffic uh, that, that hits the ETH1 routing table. I want you to send it via my ETH1 device. And then the last line here is basically to flush the, um, the IP route cache, uh, which uh, Linux has this IP route cache uh, mechanism. Uh, and this just, just clears the cache so that it, it reevaluates uh, for, for any traffic. It'll, it'll reevaluate and re, re, uh, restart its cache. Um, and so, uh, and actually, sorry, one last thing I wanted to mention is that if you're running uh, 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 Linux using the Amazon Linux AMI, uh, some of the most recent AMIs, we've actually gone ahead and added some capabilities, uh, some, some configuration in there to automatically take care of this for you. So uh, this is something that if you're running uh, you know, a, a Linux that's not Amazon Linux, uh, you want to keep this in mind, particularly when you have multiple, uh, multiple interfaces, multiple ENIs. Uh, but uh, with Amazon Linux, uh, we, we actually create something that's almost exactly what I've shown here. So, so the first top for your packet is through the IP uh, routing policy database. And uh, once then you determine, if, you, if you're using multiple routing tables, as I've, as I've just shown, then it will um, I, I, it will then route that, that traffic according to the appropriate routing table um, and will then also apply the outbound firewall rules. And all of this is analogous to what we saw in the first example, so I'm not going to recover it. Once the traffic has uh, passed, the, uh, uh, passed the instance, it'll be sent into the, the virtual private cloud network on one of those ENIs. And then, and of course, that's really important because um, the, the security group rules and the uh, source desk check flag and the network ACLs, all of that uh, matters. All of that is kind of bound to the ENI and the, the subnet that that ENI is in. So it's really important, when, you know, particularly when troubleshooting uh, networking problems with instances that have multiple ENIs, it's really important to make sure you understand which interface is being used since that'll control everything else. So, you know, once we're into the, the VPC network, uh, we're going to use the, the, the uh, source desk check or the, the source desk check and the security group rules that, that are applicable to that ENI are applied. Again, this is just like we described earlier. Uh, then we will, so this is, we now have the, the two kind of different steps here that apply when you're sending traffic between subnets. So in our first example, again, it was just all within the same subnet. So the routing table and the network ACLs don't apply in that situation. But now that we're going between subnets, they do. So Virtual Private Cloud has the ability to configure your route tables. And you can actually configure different route tables on each subnet. Uh, and so if you go into our management console and you look at the subnet, you pull up your subnet detail, you can see the, um, you know, the details for the subnet itself, the, the IP range that, that that subnet is in, along with the VPC, along with the availability zone. But as you can see here, you can also see the uh, routing table that's applied to it and the network ACL that's applied. And you can change both the network ACL and the routing table on a subnet anytime you want. Uh, so this is a pretty powerful feature to, uh, you know, to, to build program, you know, it's, it's a programmable network. You can configure this uh, dynamically using our APIs and, and our command line tools. Uh, but in this case, uh, I see that the route table is this RTB. You can see the ID there. And you can see that the routes that are uh, configured in that, so I, in this case, I have uh, a route to my VPC as a whole. My VPC in this case is just 10 slash 16. And so there's a, a destination route to that, as well as then a default route through to an IGW. And, and an IGW is just an internet gateway. So any traffic that doesn't go to another instance in my, in, in this, coming out of this subnet will be routed to my IGW. You can also look at the, um, the routing table directly. There's a separate view in the management console where you can uh, pull up the routing table alone. And that will show you, if there's a few other flags you can see here. Uh, and, and the most important, I think, is the status. Um, you can see both of these routes are, are active. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit later about, about that as well. Um, routing tables in VPC are longest prefix match, just like routing tables on an instance are. So we, you know, when, you, when a packet is going outbound, uh, we, from a subnet, we look at all of the rules in the routing table and we choose the one that has the most specific match to the destination IP address. And, and then that is, the, that is the route that is used to, to forward the traffic. Um, all right, so after we pass through the routing table, um, oh, sorry, one last thing I wanted to mention about routing tables is that 
uh, you, to, you're not able to specify a route in the routing table that's more specific than the VPC as a whole. So you can see here that I have a route to 10 slash 16, which is my VPC. That's done automatically by the system when you create a routing table. Uh, you're, you're not able to actually create something that's more specific. But you can create routes uh, for destinations that are um, other than your VPC itself. So we, we go through the routing table and we uh, identify what the next stop is going to be. And at that point then, the packet is processed by our network ACLs. Again, network ACLs apply when traffic is going between subnets. And so, uh, actually, the, the previous uh, slide showed the, uh, uh, the subnet, and, and you can see the network ACL is actually visible on the subnet itself. But we, can, we also have a separate view where you can see the network ACL uh, just as on, on its own. And so you can see each of the rules uh, in, the, in the network ACL. Uh, in the case of the outbound network ACLs, we will match on the destination IP address and the destination port and, and protocol and the overall protocol. And so I wanted to, at this point, kind of briefly compare and contrast security groups and network ACLs uh, just so that you can understand what are the differences between them so you, so you can see the differences. And really, the first three are, are, are identical. They, in both cases, you can filter them both inbound and outbound. You can configure rules in both directions. Um, they're fully manageable through all of our normal uh, systems, our tools and APIs. Um, all of them, and, and this is you know, for VPC specifically, all of them can filter on TCP or UDP ports. Uh, as well as any IP protocol. So you can create rules, for example, to, to allow IPsec traffic, you know, which is an IP protocol 50, for example. However, there are then differences. Uh, security groups are stateful, which means that when you have a rule that allows traffic inbound, uh, we will automatically then create a, essentially a, an ephemeral rule that allows the outbound traffic that matches that flow. So you, you only have to allow the traffic in one direction to get the flow going in both directions. Um, on, the, on the other side, network ACLs are in fact stateless, which, which can be uh, you know, a, a point of, uh, of uh, can, can, pro can, can cause problems when you configure the inbound side, for example, but you don't configure return traffic uh, because you would need to uh, and in fact, the console even prompts you for this. Uh, if, you, if you allow inbound TCP traffic and you put a restrictive ACL in place for outbound traffic, you would need to allow it back to the normal ephemeral port range, which is you know, 1024 to 65535. Um, again, security groups apply to all traffic in and out of, of the instance. In and out of every ENI, you can have security groups and the traffic is filtered through the security group. However, network ACLs only come into play when you're going between between subnets. Uh, security groups, you can have multiple security groups on every instance. And again, you can dynamically add or change the uh, security groups that an instance or an ENI belongs to. Uh, but network ACLs, uh, there's just one ACL for the subnet. So if you want to change the rules, you can change the rules anytime. You can also change the whole ACL. So you can create a new ACL that has all the rules you want and then do a switch and, and basically make that new ACL the active one. Uh, but uh, you can only have one ACL that's active on a subnet at any one time. Uh, with uh, network ACLs, uh, I, I like to think of network ACLs as being similar to uh, router ACLs, if you're familiar with configuring you know, routers, uh, in as much as you can interleave allow rules and denies. So you could create, for example, a couple very limited allows and then a blanket deny for a whole, you know, I'm gonna allow port 80 traffic from a couple hosts, but then I'm gonna deny port 80 traffic from anywhere else, and then I'll continue processing. So you can interleave those allows and denies. And finally, um, because of that interleaving and because, uh, well, because of that interleaving and the fact that you can um, have these allows and denies, uh, network ACLs are, are ordered. So as you saw, uh, as we see here, the, the rule number is the ordering. You know, so when you go to create your network ACLs, you're able to go in and say, I want to create a new rule number 201, and that'll be logically inserted there uh, in, um, in a numeric order. Okay, so um, packets are processed through our outbound network ACL, and then they're routed at this point. Uh, you know, the route, assuming the route, well, this is all within the VPC, so this traffic would be then routed over to instance C, and we're processed on the way back in, we start processing through the, the network ACL on the inbound side. Uh, so on the inbound side, the, uh, we compare the source IP address and the destination port, just like we do in security groups uh, in terms of the, the, the comparison of the, those I, the, the source IP 
and the destination port. We do the same thing on the network ACLs, and those are processed through the inbound network ACL rules. Um, and then really the last three steps are, are analogous to what we saw in the first example where we process then through the security group, uh, the source desk check, and then the inbound firewall on the instance, and that traffic is then delivered ultimately to the instance. So now we've seen traffic go uh, both between two instances in one subnet and between instances in different subnets. So now I'm going to talk about the third case, uh, which is traffic from uh, a VPC uh, out to the internet uh, using our internet gateway feature. And so uh, the first few steps uh, that are the first several steps actually in this example where I have instance C uh, talking out to the internet, the first few steps are pretty analogous to what we've seen or in, in previous examples. Um, really the first uh, uh, spot where there's a, a bit of a difference is in the routing table. And uh, so uh, you can see in this case that I've, uh, in my routing table, I have a default route, a zero slash zero route that points out to my internet gateway that I've created, and the status is active. Uh, so this is important uh, when you're routing traffic out to the internet. The, the routing table that's applied to the subnet uh, that the instance belongs to needs to, be, uh, needs to have a, a route out to the internet. And you don't have to create a default route. You can create routes. Uh, you, you could have a, a part of the, uh, you can create a, a specific route for certain uh, prefixes that you want to send out to the internet versus somewhere else. Uh, or you can create, you know, you can always create a default route as well. Okay, and then uh, the the next uh, stop will be uh, really at this point the traffic is you know is processed through the network ACLs and the security groups and, and all of that just as it was before. Uh, but the the last stop here is is it is that the traffic goes to the internet gateway and at this point the traffic needs to be uh, natted into its public IP address. And so the only way this occurs is if you have configured and mapped an elastic IP address to that, um, to that ENI and that IP address, that, that private IP address. Is there a question there? Yeah, I just wonder if you could explain the relationship between the main route table for VPC and the individual subnet route table. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, and, and that, that's a perfect time. Thank you. So. Uh, when you create a VPC by default, uh, you will get a, a default routing table. And, um, uh, and, and I guess I should say that uh, using our AWS Management Console, we have uh, four different options. When you, when you go to create a, a route table, or sorry, when you go to create a, a VPC, you'll have four different scenarios, everything from a kind of a simple one subnet uh, scenario uh, down to a more complex scenario that involves both VPN connectivity as well as Private, you know, public and private connectivity. And so uh, the VPC uh, out of the box will have a default route table. And then in some of those other scenarios, we'll create you secondary routing tables. Um, and if a subnet, if you create a subnet and don't specify otherwise, it will be, it will use the default route table. So again, whatever that, the rules are in that default route table, that's what will be applied. Uh, but you can always create new route tables and then you would just have to apply them to the subnets that you want those route tables to, uh, to be applicable to. And so that's what the wizard does, is it will create you, uh, it creates multiple, in some of the more advanced scenarios create multiple subnets and multiple route tables, and they do the association for you, you know, in advance, so you're kind of ready to go, bootstraps you to, to begin deploying your application. But you can always go in later and create new route tables and then associate them to the subnet. You can also then, you can disassociate in which case it would fall back to using the default route table. So I guess the message is every subnet has a route table that it will use, but there is one that's the default that if you don't specify otherwise, that's what it'll use. So as we're being processed uh, then in the Internet Gateway, uh, you need to have a, an EIP that's associated with the, um, the ENI and the, and the private IP address. And you can see here that, uh, you know, you, again, using our management console, you can see that I've, you can pull up an, an, an ENI uh, and, a, and an elastic IP address and see that the two have been associated together. Um, and, and if there's not an association, then traffic will just be dropped at this point. All right, so then in my uh, third and, uh, or sorry, my fourth scenario, uh, this is a, a situation where we have uh, a VPC, the same VPC that I've been talking about on the far left, and we have, uh, we can have one or more forms of external connectivity, private connectivity, uh, that is uh, non-internet, that is, uh, back to our, our home office or our, our headquarters data center. 
And we, today we offer two ways of doing that. The, the first is our uh, VPN connectivity. And the VPN is uh, just an IPsec VPN over the internet. Uh, and you can uh, set this up on a variety of, uh, of devices uh, that, that uh, and, and, if you, and using our management console, you can obtain configuration guidance for, for many different flavors of device. Um, so if you have a VPN device at your premise today, chances are uh, you, can get a, you can go to our management console and obtain the configuration guidance for, for that device uh, to get it connected privately into virtual private cloud. And the difference between this and the internet connectivity is that there's, there's no natting that's, that's, that's performed as the traffic is sent and received you know, into and out of the VPC. So if you... Um, if, you're, if your headquarters uses private IP addresses like 192.168 uh, and you create a VPC using 10.16, 10, 10 you can, those, those instances in your VPC will be able to directly talk with the, uh, the host at your headquarters uh, without any, any NAT or any, any kind of translation that's performed in, in the middle. And so again, you can do this with the VPN or you can do this with AWS Direct Connect. And so Direct Connect is a, uh, is a way uh, to bring uh, a, a circuit, basically, not, you know, VPN is, is done over the internet, IPsec over the internet. Uh, with Direct Connect, you establish direct uh, uh, circuits uh, or, or fiber into the AWS network. And from there, then you can provision uh, individual connections into a, a virtual private cloud. And so that provides you a real high capacity way to, to interconnect your existing data center and, and virtual private cloud. And all of this is done through what we call a VGW, or a virtual private gateway. Um, that's kind of, that's the abstraction that we present uh, in, in between the, the, the headquarter network and the, the VPC. And so you can actually configure both VPN connectivity and direct connect connectivity in a, in a single virtual private gateway. Uh, and when you do so, if you, if you can provision both, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll talk about that in, in one moment. I'll talk about what happens when you have both. So the, um, as we talk about then, you know, let's, let's say I have a host D sitting here on my far right, and I would like to have my instance C uh, talk to my, inst my host D. Uh, so many of the, the steps are analogous to what we saw in the first few examples, but the, the, the kind of the first step where there's a little bit of difference is the routing table step. And so we've seen routing tables uh, several times here today, uh, but I want to point out a couple things about uh, uh, route tables as they pertain to VGWs. One is that we just added a, a feature to, called route propagation. And this is a, a way to have any of the uh, routes that we see in, in the VGW, that is via your VPN or your Direct Connect, will automatically then propagate them into your VPC, uh, which, is, which is really convenient for use cases where you have mi a mixture of internet and private connectivity. In, th in this case, for example, I have a default route that points out to my internet gateway. But what I do in this routing table is create more specific routes that point back at my home network. And so, for example, if I add a third prefix, like I have two here in, in the example, but if I were to add a third prefix uh, using route propagation, that would actually just automatically propagate into my VPC. And so my instances would just start using that, that, uh, this, the, the VPN or direct connect path to get to that new prefix. And uh, so you can see that in this case, uh, that it says yes to propagated, which means that those routes came into this table by way of route propagation. You can also set, set the, these up statically if you like. Uh, but in this case, uh, any traffic then that comes out of this subnet or any subnet that's associated with this routing table will be sent to the 192.168, uh, to, those, to those two ranges will be sent over to the VGW. And one other thing I wanted to mention at this point is that uh, you can sometimes see in your routing table a status of black hole, the, the, red, the red dot. Uh, and uh, it's important to understand the behavior of the routing table in this case, uh, which is a little bit different from uh, some, some traditional uh, route table behaviors. And in this case, um, the, the way that virtual private cloud works with these routes is that uh, we do longest prefix match on the routing table, and we then pick the route that is that is the longest match. And if the status is black hole, then, then that traffic is just discarded. So black hole routes apply. They, they're not ignored uh, as, you, as, as, as some route table implementations do ignore uh, invalid or, or invalid routes, for example. But, but our implementation does treat those, it's, for, for security reasons, we do treat those as valid routes uh, and we would discard traffic that's sent to those ranges. Quick question in the back. So 
That's right. You're right. The question is, when the tunnel comes up, the routes are inserted, and that's right. So when you're, um, if you're using a, a VPN or Direct Connect connection using BGP, uh, as soon as you start advertising those routes to us, then those routes are, if you use route propagation, those routes will be propagated through, and their status will become active. Okay, so, so after we've passed the, the routing table within the, the subnet, then we uh, are processed by the routing table in the VGW. And this is not something that you can directly um, ins inspect, but one of the uh, suggestions we have is that you can, you can actually create a routing table in your VPC and set up route propagation to that table. And you, you don't have to associate that route table with any subnet, but that route table will reflect all of the routes that we see in the VGW routing table. So it's a kind of a simple way to create a, um, oops, uh, to create a, uh, a view into the VGW routing table. Now, the routing table in the VGW includes all of the routes that we see from your VPNs and from your Direct Connect links. And uh, we have uh, policies on our side that will prefer Direct Connect paths over VPN paths uh, if, if the Direct Connect path is available. But you can use the two as, as redundant backup mechanisms. So, for example, if you have a Direct Connect link, you can also have a VPN link. And if your Direct Connect link is unavailable, um, the, the traffic will be automatically routed, rerouted over, your, over the VPN. So uh, uh, traffic uh, enters the VGW routing table. And uh, uh, this is an example. You can actually inspect uh, what you're sending to us uh, through BGP. Uh, if, you, uh, if you use a, a BGP-based VPN, uh, you can, uh, we have uh, the, the URL at the top actually shows, uh, has examples for a variety of different devices. Uh, to inspect what VGP is currently advertising to the VGW. And uh, then you know, the routes that are being advertised to the VGW will be used to route the traffic. So uh, this is a simple way to, to kind of inspect what's being done in the network. And if you have, any, uh, if you have static VPNs, we just launched um, a, 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 the, the static VPN feature, which allows you to configure a VPN and, and just tell us the, what, what static uh, routes you want us to, to use in our VGW, those routes will be used as long as the VPN is up. So if the VPN is down, obviously there's, there's, no, there's no path for us, but uh, if, if they're up, we'll use those routes. All right. Uh, and then uh, following the VGW routing table, the traffic is delivered via the VPN or the Direct Connect link. And of course, uh, w one thing that we often see with customers is that uh, on, the, on, the, on the CGW, on, on the customer VPN router, uh, there are, there's often a firewall or, or that's configured as well as uh, a routing table, a local routing table on, the, on that VPN device. And sometimes that needs to be updated. Um, we don't have specific guidance here because this is uh, very much dependent on the way you build your home network. But uh, it's, you know, it's important that as you configure all of your uh, infrastructure in the cloud, which you can do through our management console and our APIs, you also configure uh, the, the home infrastructure, the headquarters-based infrastructure, to route that traffic, to allow the traffic in, and then to route it to the rest of your internal network. OK, so really, we've, uh, we've kind of come to the conclusion of, uh, of this uh, presentation. We've talked about four different scenarios, uh, routing traffic kind of within a subnet, um, routing traffic between two subnets in virtual private cloud, uh, and then uh, routing traffic to the internet, as well as routing through our VPN and direct connect connectivity. So um, I am, I'm wrapped up here, uh, but I will definitely take questions for the next few minutes. And I'm also going to be in the booth um, later today, this afternoon, if you have any uh, questions or you'd like to.